That's torn. Yes. Can you imagine? Me it's it's a very tall skuma. Okay, I'm not a very tall person, but it's tall. Oh yeah, almost live. We are now live on Facebook. Wonderful. Just a minute. We are live on Facebook. I'm seeing people are joining. Please join us, share, share to your friends, share to your farmers. We are starting around 10 sharp. So I was saying that that Skumawiki is very tall. How many years? In um, I think it's about two years old and it's an indigenous Kumawiki. Mm. Just to show that our own indigenous foods are superior mm -hmm. and resilient. So I was really excited to take that picture because it just shows that we can feed ourselves. Imagine if you have like four or five of those kumas that you're, you're plucking in your kitchen garden, you'll never go hungry. You're not, it's quite tall. How tall can yeah. it go? I don't know. Let's see. I don't want to cut it short because I'm five foot three. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. This looks like almost seven feet. Eh? Yeah. Hey, that's tall. Do you, need to put, um, you need to put some sticks to put stability or it will be fine. Sometimes you need to, but mm -hmm. this one, imagine, just stood on its own. Okay. This one is standing on its own. That's quite interesting. I know. I have never seen such a tall skumawiki. In Kwanzaa in a dry area. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's Nenya. No, this is my mahio. You know, my mahio is also classified as a, um, an asal, a married land, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have not visited my mayo farm, but I hope I will before the end Please. of the year. <laughs> You're welcome. Please come. Come, come. I will, I will. So we have three people online who are still joining. Three people online. Let me share the link to social media, but I think we'll start around 10. Let me share the link to social media. Sure.
So hi everyone. My name is Vice Sheba Ratemo. I work for Pelam Kenya. I'm privileged to introduce one of our master trainer who is going to take us through the topic on growing onions and leafy vegetables in our lands. And her name is Sylvia Kuria. So Sylvia, welcome. I want to hand over the session to you. You take through the presentation for today and also answer some questions that might arise from your presentation. So Karibu Sana, you can introduce yourself and then you give us a background about yourself and then you now start. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ratemo, and thank you very much for Pelham, uh, Kenya uh, Biovision Africa Trust, and the Knowledge Center for Organic Agriculture for organizing these sessions, whereby, you know, as master trainers and farmers, we are disseminating information on how to be able to grow food organically and how we can be able to grow sustainably in a way that you know, we have access to safe food for our families and communities, both now and in the future. So today I wanted to share my experience. By the way, it's not scientific, but I think for me, it's just a farmer to farmer and being able to share my experiences on how we've been able to make our farms profitable in terms of growing onions and leafy vegetables. So um, as you've been told, my name is Sylvia Kuria and I'm a smallholder farmer. Uh, we are growing our vegetables on our farm in Maimahio in Kenya. And um, I also have um, a business. So we have a shop known as Sylvia's Basket, whereby we sell organic produce from our farm. And we also source organic produce from smallholder farmers from all over Kenya. And we work with different partners, including uh, Koan, Pelam, Vision Africa Trust to be able to work with smallholder farmers, access markets for their organic produce. And um, I think one of the ways that uh, we're really excited to share what we do is that, you know, sometimes when we want people to, um, you know, to adopt technologies, it's very important that there's also a market so that farmers are able to get a good return and they're able to get something back. And one, area that I know has been quite neglected is actually uh, the arid and semi-arid lands. I'm going to speak about it in my presentation. But for me, I'm really passionate about documenting my experiences on how to grow food in these dry land areas. You know, if you go online, you'll hardly find any information on how to grow food in dry land areas, which makes it very difficult for farmers to think that organic works. And in fact, most times we'll ask, can you really grow organic produce in a very dry place like yours? And my answer is yes. It takes time, it takes patience. And I'm not able to talk about everything because of uh, like the limited time we have. But then I'm going to share my contacts at the end of this presentation and you can be able to reach out to me at any time and we can share more, especially if you're coming from a dry area and you want to be able to be productive and you want to be able to manage pests and actually grow organic, I believe that um, at the end of this presentation, you're going to be very encouraged. So allow me to please go ahead. Oh, before I go ahead, as you can see in the picture, I'm posing there with us Kumawiki. You might wonder what it's all about, but this Kumawiki is actually an indigenous Kumawiki uh, that has grown very tall. And I just wanted you to see that our indigenous foods are superior our indigenous foods are able to be resilient. I actually took this picture in our Memahio farm. You can see, okay, it's a bit green, but you can see it looks like a dry area, but look at how prolific that Skumawiki is. That's just one, we have many others. I'm not that tall, you might think maybe I'm tall or, or maybe I'm not too short anyway, but I'm about five foot three. And you can see that the Skuma may be about seven feet, if not long, um, higher than that. So let me go ahead with my presentation. So I want us to start by um, reflecting on what are semi-arid lands. When you think, uh, when, when you look at the map that's um, in front of you, we are basically talking about areas, you know, that uh, have a rainfall between 150 mm to 550 mm um, in the semi-arid areas and 550 mm and 850 mm 
So basically, um, you're talking about that uh, most of Kenya actually lies in semi-arid and arid lands. Uh, when you look at the map, uh, the dark pink area is actually the arid lands. Sorry, I didn't say that very clearly. The arid lands get 150 mm to 550 mm of rainfall per year. And semi-arid is 550 to 850. In our area, in my Mahiu, we are getting maybe about uh, maybe 600, 700, depending. But you know, we've been struggling with the um, uh, climate change and uh, the drought. But then, ideally, we normally get maybe about 600 mm. But when you look at Kenya, you can see that 80% is actually in the Asal areas. When you see the yellow, it's talking about the Asal pockets. So we have some places in Yeri, Thika, in Koibatek, um, you know, in uh, Kuria, which is uh, towards Western Kenya, in Suba, whereby you have some pockets of uh, some Asal areas. So basically, 80% of Kenya is actually in an Asal area, arid and semi-arid. And 36% um, percent of the population live in these areas. And, uh, you know, lots of our national livestock, you know, normally comes from the dry areas. And that's why during the drought, we were really heat. And it was very tough for many farmers out there because their, um, their animals did not have any fodder. And temperatures would normally be very high with high rates of evapotranspiration. But I just wanted us just to know that as we're talking about this topic on how to grow food in these areas, we are actually dealing with majority of Kenya, which is 80%. So we won't talk about the production problem. When you think about asal areas, they're normally low potential areas. And what basically that means is that many times even donors or uh, development partners will not focus on supporting farmers in these kind of areas. You find that um, you know, the projects may not be very successful. So because of that, you find that um, they say that they may not want to really invest in it. And the investment has mainly been on livestock. But um, as we are moving on uh, you know, towards thinking about wholeness, and making sure that we have good diets. We really need to have our green leafy vegetables. We are later on going to speak about um, you know, how nutrient dense they are and why they are very important for us to actually focus on. And you normally find that uh, green leafy vegetables, actually high value crops, like now during the drought, anyone who had water was really made a lot of money to be honest being able to uh, sell their green leafy vegetables. And one thing I find about Kenyans, which is wonderful, is we eat a lot of leafy vegetables. We eat a lot of leafy vegetables and people are always you know, trying that every meal there's a vegetable. So it means they are high value, they are always sold out in the market, but still not considered, especially in the arid areas. And then we find that our deer farmers are still planting maize and other crops that are heavy feeders or require copious amounts of rain. You'll find in my village, um, I'm originally from a place called Ndeya in Limuru. And you'll find that it's also an asal area. And in the short rains, September, when there's not a lot of rain, you'll find my dear neighbors planting carrots and cabbages and maize. It's not very uh, good use of the land. And even when I ask them, why did you plant maize? Many of them will say, even if I don't get anything, to eat the maize, the cows will eat it. But if you think about the amount of space that goes wasted, you know, with poor rainfall, planting maize, which is a heavy feeder, and getting nothing out of it. I think we really have to shift. Um, in fact, as I was doing this presentation, I was so tempted to talk about sorghum, millet, and other drought resistant crops, you know, like yams and cassavas. But um, this time around, let's focus on green leafy vegetables and onions. But I was very, 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 uh, I was, you know, I was thinking, no, we have to talk about our indigenous foods. But this time around, you're talking about green leafy vegetables. And you find that our indigenous foods, of course, are resilient, but then most times are neglected, unfortunately. Here is another skuma wiki. Uh, I normally plant only indigenous skuma wiki. Um, and this is another type that doesn't grow tall, but grows bushy. Can you believe this is only one plant? Only one plant with many, 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 many branches. It doesn't flower. Can you imagine, you know, the ones that we buy in the shop, 
the seed of skuma wiki, most times they flower very quickly and you have to keep buying the seed. But I'm not a prisoner to anybody's agrovet because all I have to go is to get go to my skuma. I get a small shoot, I plant, and I have enough greens all year round. So I want to talk about um, growing of leafy vegetables in the drylands. And uh, to be honest, I'm going to focus on our indigenous African vegetables. If you think about all these vegetables that I'm going to talk about, they have a lot of nutrition. I'm telling you, if you have all of these vegetables in your garden or your kitchen garden, or you're selling it in the market, you don't need to add any other vegetable, I can assure you. So um, I want us to focus on the indigenous African vegetables because I am passionate about our own indigenous foods. And I believe we need to promote them, we need to eat them, we need to grow them because they're the ones that are able to be resilient in our environment. So um, here we have pumpkin leaves. These are, by the way, all the pictures are from my farm and I hope you're going to enjoy them because then they just show that, you know, that it can be done. So these are pumpkin leaves that we have uh, planted. And I just want to mention something here. Um, I don't know how, to, how they are called in um, English, but then we have this particular plant uh, in Kikuyu, we call it Kahorora. And this particular plant doesn't have a pumpkin as, uh, you know, the vegetable we eat because the seed, uh, you know, is not edible. Like you're not able to eat the fruit, sorry, the fruit is not edible, but you're able to get the seed and you're able to plant it out in the garden. So it's normally very nice and leafy, as you can see, and it's drought resistant. Then we also have nerema. I'll speak about it later on. And this is Malaba spinach. We have saga, which is spider plant, mito, slender leaf, kunde, cowpeas, managu, terere, amaranth, mrenda. Many of us normally say you don't want to take mrenda because it is too slimy, but it is so, so good for you. In fact, I was reading, if you actually do your reading, on the history of Miranda, which is also known as Jute Malo. Do you know Egypt, uh, like a uh, long time ago, Egyptian princesses used to take a lot of Jute Malo because it was very good for a good skin and good hair. So if you want to have long hair and beautiful skin, Miranda should be part of your diet. Then we also have Kanzira, or we call this indigenous kuma that I've shown you earlier as Kaguru. I don't know why it's called Kaguru. <laughs> But it does very well. Uh, and this for our friends who may not be from Kenya is a, a collard, it's a collard green. And then we also have the Moringa tree leaves. I included it here intentionally for us to be able to open our minds to know that Moringa can also be grown. It dries very well in dryland areas. And the leaves, you don't only have to dry them, but you can be able to chop them up, fry them and add them to your indigenous vegetables. So I wanted us to think about the nutritional value of African leafy vegetables. So we think about it, okay, this is, uh, this is a picture of um, some amaranth we have. It's a wide leaf um, amaranth and it's normally uh, purplish in color. And you know something I also wanted to share with people at our shop sometimes, I'm sure not anyone listening to me, but many times you find some people would be like, oh, no, 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 don't send me the red amaranth. My children don't like how it looks. My children don't want to eat it. But you know, let me tell you people, the more color in your food, the more nutrition. Always remember that. And when you're eating your food, maybe a quick tip, uh, since you're talking about nutrition, a quick tip is make sure your plate is always colorful. You must eat a rainbow. When you look at your plate, it must have five to six colors. When I normally do training and talk to farmers, most people normally say my plate only has three colors but talking about five to six. So if you get indigenous vegetables that are red, just to know the nutrition value is very high. When you think about, um, you know, I decided to put down the nutritional value in bullet points so that you can clearly see how nutritious and how healthy our own vegetables are. They have a lot of iron, protein, dietary fiber, which is so important, especially for children and the aged and pregnant women. Hold it again for, you know, the development of our brains and the children, uh, you know, uh, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, calcium, folic acid, vitamin A, B, C, and K, antioxidants. And you know, one of the things I just wanted to point out here that I also feel why um, we managed, I think, hopefully, uh, that Africa was able to 
um, you know, I mean, COVID pandemic was really, really a terrible time for many of us. I know, I understand. But I also feel that our foods also contributed in helping us to, you know, like manage the pandemic, you know. And I think because we really focus on eating well, we really focus on eating a lot of indigenous foods. I think that gave us a lot of nutrition, more than we could ever think or imagine. And I just want us to think about it. Every time you eat, every time you put food on your plate, ask yourself, is this food nutrition? Is, it, is this food good for me? Does it have a lot of nutrients? And now that you know how healthy our indigenous vegetables are, I hope even as consumers, you're going to consider them highly. By the way, at our outlet, Sylvia's Basket, we are very big on share on actually selling our own indigenous foods. I can share about that later. So I want to go into soil management. You know, how do you manage your soil when you want to grow your indigenous vegetables? Um, I was forced to do sunken beds, which can also be known as zypids. Zypids were originally done, um, I think in some parts of North Africa for growing cereals. Uh, which is the maize and beans. So basically you'll find that farmers in the dry areas would uh, be digging trenches, maybe a foot deep, and then they fill the trench maybe with manure or uh, like with compost material. And then they normally um, plant in their cereals. And then those who are able can mulch. But generally you find even if you have short rains, these pits, you know, like these sunken beds are able to hold a lot of water and uh, you're able to actually get a crop out of it. And in my mind, again, I've said, I don't think we should focus on planting uh, maize in dry land areas. And what I've done on my farm is that I have sunken beds. It may not be extremely clear, but maybe let me try with my cursor here. You can see, uh, you know, this is the top of the soil. So it's sunken all the way until down here. And the reason why we don't have mulch right now is because it was so dry. We didn't have any green matter, but now we have mulch and we'll be mulching them. But you'll find that you know you're able to actually dig trenches. You see, this is a trench, a trench, this is a pit, and you're able to grow our vegetables in here. And then something else, and you find like this, then you're able to retain uh, moisture, you're able to retain the nutrition, you're able to reduce on soil erosion, and your indigenous vegetables are going to do so much better when they are dug in a, a sunken bed. And that's another way of managing your soil to make sure that you're able to grow your uh, uh, um, like your vegetables for a long time in a dry area. I don't know if this is very clear, but I normally do a lot of fertility trenches. Um, so basically this one is not complete. I just want to take a picture just for purposes for you uh, uh, for us to be able to see. This is also the top part of the soil. And what we have done is we have dug a trench and then when we put matter, we put like carbon matter, sticks, we put stew. I know these are not yet dry, but I just want to take a picture. But you can also put compost material. You can be able to put sticks and twigs so that as they're composting slowly, they're able to actually help add nutrition to your soil. And you'll find some farmers don't have a lot of uh, manure. I'm going to be talking about green manuring as a way of also managing your soil. So as I talk about this management of soil, it applies both to leafy vegetables and it also applies to the onions. I'm also going to talk about green manuring, which is another strategy that we use to make sure that we're able to manage our soils. So basically being able to do trench, adding uh, compost, uh, like material and carbon sticks, twigs. That's why planting trees is very important because I know someone is going to ask me, where will we get them? And I will say, before you start your garden, plant trees. So we have to practice a lot of agroforestry for us to be able to have good soil. In fact, I say for you to have good crop, you must have lots of trees. So I want to talk about um, growing them seasonally. I don't think you can grow them all year round and expect to get the same uh, results because uh, we are very lucky to actually have, uh, you know, um, you know, in Africa, one thing I always say is that we are very lucky because we can actually be able to grow food all year round. And one thing I just wanted to say is that our indigenous vegetables are also seasonal. You may not know about, think about it actively, but for us who are in dry areas, we have to be very careful about what we grow. So um, I wish this was a class and people could dance on me, but uh, I don't know 
if you know what this vegetable is, but it's called derema, the Malabar spinach I had talked about. And it's very interesting, you know, like some of us who are originally from Western, when we come to Central and we find people feeding their cows, such a nice vegetable, why? <laughs> we're mortified. We're so surprised because we're just like, this is food. These have good, such good vegetables. You know, you don't even have to go there or worry about, um, you know, uh, spinach. You don't have to buy this as a spinach. This Njerema, let me tell you, is drought resistant. The one that we have on our farm uh, in Deya at home, we it just got like about one week of rain. It has sprouted so much, we are now even selling it in the market. So I wanted to share the different vegetables to grow during the different seasons. So during the long rains, which is the wet season, I highly recommend um, we plant managu. Why am I saying that? Managu does well, uh, like during the long rains, mainly because um, it's not really affected by pests. One of the things I know we struggle with is the pests. They are really, really troublesome. You'll find that the aphids, the spider mites are really going to be on our managu. But if you plant them during the wet season, they normally do so much better. They are green, they are leafy. As long as you plant them with lots of manure, they normally do very well. And then we can also plant here, uh, for, for those who may not know um, the different kinds of uh, vegetables, uh, if you're not from Kenya, please refer to my previous slides where I have uh, specified what they are. So terry is amaranth, also does very well. Skumawiki are the colored greens. Saga is spider plant, very, very, very high in iron. In fact, that is one of the vegetables that has the highest amount of iron. Now you know. Then we have Mito, which is the slender leaf, and Brenda, as I told you, which is the beauty solution. And then uh, these do very well in the long rains. And in the short rains, I would recommend we focus on planting pumpkin leaves, the Rema in the picture, as I have talked about. Then there's the wide leaf terrain, the one I told you people that was um, you know, white and red. They do very well. The white leaf terrain need very little water, but do very well. Then we also have kunde, which is the cow peas. Um, and then you also have the moringa tree leaves. Of course, once you have the moringa trees, they're going to be producing a lot of uh, leaves all year round. So um, I want us to also consider if you're in an asal area, do not try to plant a lot of managu in the heat of January or February. They're going to be infested by pests. You're going to see organic doesn't work. Please let us follow the seasons. Even Skumawiki will have a lot of aphids, a lot of aphids. And you're going to struggle with them and you're saying, oh, it doesn't work. This organic thing doesn't work. Same thing, Saga also gets aphids. Mito and Mrenda need quite a bit of water for establishing. That's why they do very well in Western Kenya, in Kisi, you know, those areas. Uh, in Nyanza, they do very well because they normally need a lot of water to establish. So um, I think it's good for us to manage our palate, manage our, uh, you know, uh, the thing that we like eating, let's eat seasonal, they'll do so much better that way. So now we know that we're in the long rains, hopefully the rains are not going to disappoint. You can go ahead and plant our managu, tereres, kumawiki, saga, mito, and merenda. I'm sorry I did not talk much about cabbage because um, I used to plant cabbage uh, some time back and it was doing quite okay. But I also noticed with the irregular rains, I'm not really planting a lot. I've left cabbage to my friends uh, in central Kenya, in Kinangop, where it rains every morning. Those are the ones who should plant that. So um, my, in my presentation, I'm mainly going to focus on the African leafy vegetables because I feel those ones are the ones that are going to be successful for us in the arid and semi-arid lands. Okay, so here I want to see how to manage our pests and diseases. Um, let's go through them. So these are aphids. This is very, very common. It's a very, very common pest. If you just look behind the leaf of your skumawiki or your green leafy vegetable, you'll find, you know, this small little, you know, um, I don't know if they are friends of ours or enemies, you know, all here sucking everything out of uh, your leafy uh, greens. And then we also have uh, this chap here. He's very nice and healthy after, you know, cutworm being able to bite through your leafy greens. And then here we have another one who's an artist. This is a leaf miner that actually bores into the leaf and is able to draw for us all these nice squigglies. And then um, this is a uh, black rot, which is found mainly in uh, brassicas and green leafy 
uh, vegetables, this is a disease. So how do you manage them? Um, let me go back to this slide. If you actually plant your crops in season, you will have very little pests to manage. But if for some, for some reason or another, uh, you know, by bad luck, you find these fellas in your garden, how do you manage them? I'm going to talk about um, integrated pest management, but allow me to also give a few comments here on what works. One of the things that I know works very well with the, uh, the aphids is just being able to make your own uh, pesticide at home. Some very simple ones, all you have to do is to crush uh, garlic um, and add it to chili water and then uh, put a little liquid soap because the li li liquid soap acts as a sticker and then you spray on your vegetables maybe three to four times a week, you will not have aphids. Sometimes the way the aphids and the, sorry, the way the chili and the garlic works, it's mainly like an anti-appetite, you know, because these are sucking insects. When they come to suck or to bite, they'll come and they'll be like, mm -mm -mm, this doesn't taste so good. I don't think I like it. And they will eventually, you know, die of hunger or something. But that's one very simple way, just making your own home remedies on how you can be able to manage. But say you have a very big field. One of the things I'm also going to talk about in the next slide, as we talk about integrated pest management, is being able to use um, uh, neem oil. Uh, that one is found in the shops commercially. But you can also be able to make your own brews. I actually wondered whether I should talk about it here, but I thought it's going to take a number of slides. Um, you know, we have some many homemade brews which have been documented and done by Pelham. And I'm going to ask Pelham, uh, maybe Ratemo, at the end of this presentation, maybe you can just prepare um, a link where our listeners can actually link to, to get the information on how to make their own homemade pesticide brews, which are normally very, very effective. You don't have to go to the shop. And uh, you know we have ash brew, we have sulfur brew. And yes, thanks Ratemo, I see you giving me a thumbs up. So at the end of this presentation, she's going to share a link on how we can get this information. Yeah, there's apichi, which is also a pesticide uh, that we make again using the, uh, garlic and chili and being able to manage all these pests and diseases. Another way I think is also having field hygiene, making sure that you're able to weed Make sure you weed your garden very well. Make sure that you don't have weeds because the weeds are normally the homes of the pests. They normally stay there at, uh, during the day. Then at night, when you go to your home, the pests come out of their home, with, which are the weeds, and then they come and they devour your crops. One way I have learned, you know, like this black rot, to be honest, I have hardly seen it in my garden. I, I don't think it's ever happened. I think it only happened at the first planting because we manage our soils. If your soils are well managed and you do your soil testing, you make sure you have the right pH, you're putting in your compost, you're putting in manure. These uh, fungal diseases and soil borne diseases will not come anywhere near your vegetables. So to be honest, I don't have a lot of experience on uh, diseases for leafy greens, imagine. I'm sorry guys, because it hasn't really happened to our garden. And I've been farming maybe for about 12, 13 years actually. And you know, this kind of black rot that we are seeing here, I haven't seen on my vegetables because we take care of our soils. In terms of a pest like this, uh, the leaf miner, you will find that you might have to deal with them using maybe a trap. There's something called a pheromone trap that is able to attract the adults. Because once you catch the adults, it means they can't be able to propagate. No, is it propagate or procreate? They can't procreate, I don't know, and get babies and be able to multiply. Um, but I also had a bit of leaf miner at the beginning, but I've not seen them in my greens for many, 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 many years. And I'll share with you why. So this is uh, integrated pest management. I want us to focus first on this uh, triangle here that actually gives us guide on how we can manage pests on our garden. So number one, you talk about agronomic practices. We talk about uh, crop rotation, planting resistant varieties, um, intercropping, and actually being able to protect 
are beneficial microorganisms. Do you know that the microorganisms in the soil actually, um, you know, when you use synthetic inputs, let me go backwards. When you use synthetic inputs and chemicals and pesticides, you actually kill your friends. You actually kill your friends in the soil. And those friends are actually um, helping you keep away the pests. This is going, I mean, it's quite detailed and very scientific, uh, but any of you who are listening to me and want to learn the link between pests and the soil, you can listen to a lady called Elaine Ingram. I think that's her name, Elaine Ingram. She's a scientist and talks a lot about the link between pests, diseases, and the soil microbiome. The soil microbiome is basically the soil microbiology. You know, so if you have got good soils, if you're composting, you'll find that your soils are actually able, the microorganisms in the soil are actually able to manage the pests that you see with your eyes. You know, it's amazing. The soil is such an amazing, amazing thing that were given by our maker. And if you just take good agronomic practices, number one, and that's why you see this is the basic practice of IPM. Your agronomic practices have to be top notch. Take good care of your soil. And then also do crop rotation. So for example, you planted managu or a crop that was infested by spider mite. Don't plant another one like that again. I realized that amaranth terere is never affected by spider mite. Is hardly, mine is hardly ever affected by aphids. So if I planted managu and it was affected by spider mites, the next season I'm going to put an amaranth or I'm going to put, in fact, one um, crop, which is so resistant, the one called the Rema, the Malaba spinach, the vine, it's a spinach vine. I have never seen anything eating it, sincerely. Let me tell you, I have never seen a single pest eating the Rema, never, ever. It is such a good vegetable to grow. It's very tasty. It goes very well with ugali. And imagine it's not affected by pests. So if you actually are able to know your agronomic practices, if you actually, doing uh, like your rotation. Now the resistant varieties is actually like the nderema. You know, even the pumpkin leaves are hardly affected by anything. They normally do extremely well. So you also have to be able to open your mind, get to know the varieties and grow what does well in your area. And then also being able to, uh, you know, monitor, you know, how many times do you walk in your garden to actually monitor and see what is happening. And many times, um, if you're practicing organic farming, organic farming is more prevention than anything else. So you have to do a lot of and a lot of prevention. So you have to monitor, you have to forecast. And forecasting is basically saying, okay, we are going into the dry season. What should I plant? And being very wise about what you're going to plant. How should I plant it? You know, and um, being able to use also the mechanical and physical natural control. Something about Kenyans, let me just go back and say, Kenyan, if you're addicted to Pigadawa, you're going to scout, you're going to see their pests here in the evening, in your knapsack with chemicals, you go spray. And I normally tell my farmers, one of the easiest way of managing pests is actually just to physically remove them. Just go, if you find a skoma wiki at the back has a lot of aphids, pluck it out. Pluck it out and go and burn it, you know, destroy it and put it away from the field. If you just pluck out one leaf of skumawiki, you have actually dealt with a thousand generations of the aphids. Isn't that easy? It's not that difficult. So being able to do physical and natural control. So when you look at this picture here, why, I, why did I put a random picture of my farm with flowers? These flowers here have done so much work for me. Let me tell you, as we look at this chart, the thing that has worked the most for me in actually managing leaf miner and aphids are these flowers. These flowers attract predator. Predators, maybe, um, I don't know who they are, to be honest, but I know they are good, they are my friends. When you have a wide variety, if you have a good biodiversity on your farm, you find that you create a natural balance. So you attract predators that actually eat the pests. I don't know if there are wasps that visit my farm because of the flowers, I have no idea. But whoever comes, I'm very grateful to them. And if you come to my farm and you're welcome to visit anytime, you will find that we have these bands of flowers in between my vegetables. You can see here, 
maybe it's not very clear, but here we have some cassava, here we have some, um, some amaranth. Uh, in between here, it's not so clear, but I have some rosemary, but then I have these beautiful, colorful flowers. They're called, um, they're not calendulas, but in, they're in that family of marigolds. But you just find that flowers will attract predators. The more biodiversity you have, the natural balance. So for us, we're actually looking for natural balance. And then you can uh, then go to biological control. I talked about it briefly, about pheromone traps. Again, I don't want to go into great detail, but the pheromone traps in uh, brief is basically a trap that is able to um, have a scent. So the pheromone trap actually just has, um, what do you call it? It emits a scent that attracts specific insects. Okay, for example, for us now who during the uh, long rains are planting um, maize, you might be affected by the fall armyworm. But if you don't want the fall armyworm to really affect you, you can put in a, a pheromone trap that is going to attract the male, a scent that is going to attract the male of that insect. And you put the pheromone trap on a sticker. So when the male comes, unfortunately his life will end on the sticker. He leave the women as widows and they're not able to procreate. So that's one of the ways of biological control using pheromone traps or being able to actually introduce predators. I know um, this is mainly done by um, the large flower farms who have greenhouses, you know, because you know even with export nowadays, they say that your flowers should not have high pesticides. And what they're doing is they actually buy uh, the pests, uh, predators, put them in the greenhouses and they eat the rest. Even yesterday I was talking to someone at Sipen and they're actually working on doing biological control for spider mites. So exciting for those of us in dryland areas, spider mite affects our indigenous leafy vegetables. I hope the project works very well because now they're going to be able to give us the predators of spider mites. They'll actually bring other insects to eat the spider mites on the farm, which is a wonderful thing. And then um, the final, and that's why it's put in a very small, tiny, tiny triangle, is chemical control. And for us who practice organic, what we are calling chemical is biological. So we're not going to use synthetic inputs. And the chemical control that I recommend is neem oil. That is the only one that I recommend. or the chemical control that I recommend is the list that Ratemo is going to share with us, whereby we're able to make our own uh, pesticides using natural ingredients. So that is how to manage pests. I hope that's clear. Okay, so now let's talk about growing onions. I don't know how the time is going. I think I'm fine. Yeah, I think I'm doing okay. Yeah, sorry people, you have to listen to my voice for a very long time. <laughs> I hope it's interesting and I hope it's going on very well. Okay, so let's talk about onions. So that's a picture of some onions we had harvested and we're going home to enjoy. I normally grow red and white onions and spring onions and garlic chives. We normally grow about and uh, leek onion. I grow about four or five different kinds of onions on my farm. So onions are one of the most consumed vegetables globally. And by the way, you guys, I didn't put the statistics here, but when I, was, um, when I was just going through my work and just doing my research, it was very interesting to note that of course, India eat a lot of onions and another country found very interesting, was it Libya? I think it was Libya. And it was a country in North and Africa that was competing with Indians, whereby an adult in one year eats more than 36 kgs of onions per person. I was like, <laughs> I was so amazed, you know, that, um, you know, our friends out there are eating a lot of onions, but they're good. Onions really, really make the food very, very tasty, especially if you try out different kinds of onions, you'll be amazed that each onion has got its unique taste. So onions are a very common vegetable. And one reason why we actually decided to plant onions, because when you think about it, almost every single home in Kenya, in the evening when they're preparing the meal, they will try to put in an onion, almost every meal, almost every single household. So it's one of those vegetables, you grow, you'll have a market, you will not struggle. You will definitely have a market to sell your onions. 
And then, of course, they are healthy and full of antioxidants, high source of vitamin D, six and C, folate, iron, potassium. Even I remember, um, you know, the time when we were being um, educated. Uh, you know, the time when um, HIV AIDS was very prevalent. And I remember one of the things that, uh, you know, we got taught, you know, like in these classes, you know, uh, was that onions were very good against the HIV varia, uh, virus. I've never forgotten that. I was still a child, but I found that very interesting that they talk about onions and tomatoes, very, very healthy. And some readings actually even talk about onions being, um, uh, they delay the onset of uh, some cancers. I do, I've not put it here because I'm not, I mean, Dick, I'm not sure about that, but I'm sure they're very healthy for you. Then, of course, as I've said, they are high-value crops that are on demand all year round. And, of course, they grow very well in the acid areas. Ideal temperatures range between 13 to 35 degrees centigrade. So let's learn now about onion. So number one, soil testing. I wish I could be in a class again. You know, sometimes I find these online things, yani, they're not very interactive. But now in my shamba, I'd have told people, who has done a soil test in the past one year? Raise hands. Anyway, you don't have to. We are representation of Kenyans that tells us only 8% of Kenyan farmers test their soils. And it's very, very important for us to test the soil. I'm going to, in the next slide, tell you why I, I took long to test my soil. I regretted, wasted a lot of time because, you know, I was saying, you know what, I'm an organic farmer. You know, organic farmers, we know what we're doing. We're actually doing our work very well, you know. We know how to take care of our soil. But if you don't test your soil, you are really going to shoot yourself in the foot. You're going to waste a lot of time. You won't know what nutrition you're going to have and what you need in the field. So of course, the soil test will measure the nutrients in your soil. It tells you what is lacking. It tells you what is in excess. And it helps you to know the most favorable inputs so as to increase your yields. So this is my hand here, and this is soil that we have worked on for a very, very, very long time. In fact, this is seven years. For my soil to look like that, it's like a total miracle, you know, a total, total miracle because we had such poor soils, which I'm going to share about in the next slide. I found that my soils were sodic. Um, there are lots of debate as I was preparing and reading, there's a lot of debate about saline and sodic soils. Some people will say it's not the, um, you know, the same thing, but for me, I just find to make this presentation simple. And I think for me, I just want to be able to give simple information that is relatable. I don't want us to go into, you know, like some very difficult things that you can't be able to apply. I mean, for me, I feel that, or rather what I would like is that when you come out of this presentation, you're going to go back home and say, I learned one, two, three, three things, and I'm going to go back home and I'm going to apply them and see how they work. So um, as I said again, you know, for me, this is just, um, what do you call it? It's my experience. I'm just sharing you with you people what I went through and what I've been able to do to manage my soil. So my soils are sodic, which means they actually have a high proportion of sodium ions, of course, side, sodium is salt, ions relative to other cations, you know, we don't have to go into some, you know, jargon here. So basically, when you go for a basic soil test, um, you, and you get your results, if the pH is above eight, your soils are sodic or yeah, have very high sodium ions. So what are the characteristics? One, they look as bad as my hand, the soil in my hand here is, you know, they are very rocky, flaky. I wanted to put another picture, but I didn't get one that was really good. But anyway, that's how they look. Very like, you can tell they don't have a lot of nutri uh, like nutrients. When you see this other soil, you can see here, it even has some leaves and twigs that were rotting in here because I do my fertility um, trenches. So you'll find with time, if you just pick soil in my garden, you're going to pick up with carbon material with sticks and twigs and rotting material in there. But if you look at this soil, dry, rocking, then look very good. So what happens to these sodic soils of ours? They're susceptible to water logging. Um, so basically water doesn't 
you know, like percolate through very well, uh, which is similar to the poor drainage, you know. You know, our place, it's like, you know, uh, maybe I was not on the farm today and everyone will call, hey, mama, kumenyesha, it has rained. You go the next day, I'm like, ah, wapi mvua? Because most of the soil, most of the water went at the top, so high erosion, because the soil can become so compact, so, so compact, that when it rains, no water is actually going through. No water is going through. So that's what you talk about, poor trafficability when wet, like water is not able to go in and spread out in the soil to be able to reach the, the roots and help the plants grow. And then um, it makes plant growth very difficult. In fact, it's just so funny. You know, when we first uh, started planting, we would actually put seed in the soil and nothing comes out, you know. And I was working with my, you know, like my colleagues there and um, sorry, like one of them was telling me that, you know, that, hey, Mama McKenna, you know, okay, that's what I'm called on the farm. They're like, imagine to make a, we actually put seed in the ground and nothing has come out. Nothing, nothing, nothing came out. So, um, you know, I found that very interesting and we wondered what was wrong because we had very poor soils. And then they are normally exclusive to arid and semi-arid land. Something else about making plant growth difficult. You can actually buy seedlings also from somewhere else. You come and put them and transplant them in your soil. And guess what happens? The seedling dies. It just dies because it doesn't get enough water. It's not able to, because the thing about these sodium ions, they're not able to help uh, you know, the other nutrients in the soil be released, it's like they bind them. So the nutrition in the soil is normally very low and your crops are not able to do very well. And then here, um, I want us to talk a bit about soil health. And um, I don't want to go into big details on how, um, you know, like this culture and, you know, some people when they see this, they remember chemistry <laughs> class and how it wasn't very fun and how you are just floating. The teacher is just talking, wondering what are they saying? Anyway, one of the ways to manage your soils is to do green manuring. Here you can see a planted beans. They work as a wonderful, wonderful green manure. I've not put the fertility trench because I've done it in the earlier slides. You can go back and check. But I wanted you people to know that the three things that I've done to manage my soil, green manuring, fertility trench, and gypsum. So basically, when you talk about green manuring, it's actually being able to plant, um, it's actually being able to plant uh, your, uh, your beans. And after four weeks, when they are looking similar to what you can see in the picture, one minute, Ratemo. Do you mind sharing your screen? Okay. Let me stop sharing. I need to attend to one thing. One minute. Do I stop sharing first? Yes. Please stop so that I share for you. Okay. Yes, um, and Sylvia continues with uh, just a break. You can post any questions you have on the chat. And I want to welcome Grace. Grace Misoy, please say hi to our participants and Karibu Sana. Thank you so much, Ratemo, and good morning, everyone. Good to have all of you today in this session. And I'm happy that we are getting a lot of information from Sylvia. 
and I hope our listeners and those who are following us um, are able to benefit from this and share their questions. And at the end of the day, Sylvia will be more than glad to share. Thank you so much and uh, let us enjoy the session. Thank you. We also have Terry, one of our multipliers. She had challenge with Facebook, so she joined us on Zoom. Just say hi, Terry, if you can. Terry, are you able to say hi? Maybe. Yes, hi. hi to all participants. I'm glad that we are all going through the sessions and it will be helpful and beneficial to us. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ratemo. I'm sorry about that, guys. I just realized that my computer charge was running low, very, very low, and I needed to have it fixed be uh, before I experienced a blackout here. Anyway, so I was talking about, now let me put my thoughts back together. So I was talking about the green manuring and the fertility trench. So the three things, I've not put the trench here because I said it was in the earlier slides, but here, when you talk about green manuring, you know, you'll find some of our farmers in the arid lands and their soils are sodic. And um, I think as I said it here, um, okay, in the previous slide, Ratemo, sorry, just go back one slide. You'll find that sodic soils are nearly exclusive to arid and semi-arid lands. So before you plant onions, which is a very high value crop that is going to cost you quite a bit, I recommend that you go for a soil test. And after you do a soil test, you need to be able to determine the pH. If the pH of your soil is above eight, kindly know that you have sodic soils. And I'm going to share with you what you're going to do to manage that. And even if your soils you'll find are not sodic, but then they have very low, um, uh, you know, uh, like they're low nutrients, and they're not doing very well, and you want to be able to increase the, the nutrients in the soil, now you'll do the next slide. So that's when I was talking about the um, green manure. And what you need to do is basically just to plant your beans. When they are four weeks old before flowering, you dig them back into the soil and you do two things. You know, the good thing about beans is that they normally fix nitrogen, and also when you dig them back into the soil, you're adding more carbon material. And as they are rotting slowly, they're actually giving nutrition to the plant. And also, they also uh, break up the soil particles. Because as I said, sodic soils or these soils that we have are normally so compact, very, very compact. So that when it rains, instead of water going through, it actually just passes through. But now you see, when you've actually planted your beans and you incorporate them back into the soil, when it rains, you find that you have opened up the, um, the soil particles and water is actually able to percolate through very well. And when water gets through, you'll find that the roots of your onions or whatever you're growing are able now to access water and also able to access nutrition. And they do very well. In fact, um, in my, I'm writing a small booklet. You know, this whole presentation will end up in a booklet, uh, which I'm almost complete. And one of the things I actually recommend as a standard procedure is actually to plant beans as a green manure before transplanting onions. For me, that one is a must. And then something else um, I want to talk about very, very briefly is the gypsum. You'll also find, uh, sorry, yeah, the gypsum. So basically you find that in your sodic soils, so we have uh, like two charts here. So you have this chart um, whereby you have your calcium and all and your sodium. And on this other side, uh, you have calcium also and the uh, sodium ion are able to be washed through. One minute. They're able to be washed through. So basically, this is a very good soil. When it rains, you can see that your calcium is actually made available. Yeah, the non-sodic soil, the calcium is actually made available. And when it rains, you can see that your um, sodium, yeah, is actually able to leach through. 
to the soil. I don't want to belabor the point here and make it very complicated. But when you see in the sodic soils, you can see the sodium is stuck, yeah? The Na sodium is stuck up here. And the calcium is also not able to pass through. So what happens is when you buy gypsum, agricultural gypsum, it's a naturally occurring um, like powder, like a lime of some sort that you can able to be found in uh, like construction sites and all. So a bag of 50 kg gypsum, the cheapest I found is 1000 shillings and gypsum actually helps to repair the soil because then it increases the calcium sulfate. So it's able to increase calcium sulfate to make sure that calcium is able to leach through the soil. And also you find in this non-sodic soil, the, um, what do you call it? The sodium, you know, is also able to leach through. But in soils that are sodic, sodium is just stuck up there. It's not able to leach through. Long and short, you have three options. You have the green manuring, you have the gypsum, which I find could be quite costly because if you're buying 1000 shillings for a 50 kg bag and a 50 kg bag, I think will only be able to serve slightly less than half an acre. So you see that's still quite a bit, you know, it's still quite expensive, but I think my recommendation would be to use green manuring. And the other one is to do the fertility trenches that will work so much better to loosen your soil and increase the nutrition. Sawa, can go to the next slide. So I want us to briefly talk about nursery establishment and companion planting in regards to planting onions. So you need to establish your nursery in a well composted bed, make sure that the bed has got good compost and um, you're able to establish. I recommend for farmers as much as you can, kindly, kindly establish your own nursery so that you can be in control of how your onions have been grown from beginning to end. But I realize this is not possible for everybody. Then you can be able to identify a good uh, a seed raiser around you who is able to raise for you the seeds well and you're able to transplant and they should be able to do very well. Um, when you think about the documentation on how to plant onions, Many times they tell us to transplant after six weeks. My own experience is to transplant after eight weeks. Why am I saying this? Us in the Asal areas, you find that it's normally very dry. You normally find that even the day you're transplanting, the sun is glaring, blaring hot. And the seedling is like a small thing like this. The onion seedling is very, very small. When you put it into the soil, you're going to find it's going to go through a lot of stress and many of them end up dying and you don't get a good return for your time and efforts, which is very painful because the onion seeds are very expensive. And then imagine they're going to stay in the nursery for six to eight weeks. Then the day you transplant, they die. You know, it makes no sense. But remember, before you transplant, you need to make sure that your, your, your bed, you know, I normally like you can see the picture, I normally plant my onions in, in one meter beds. So if they're normally like one meter, one meter by 30 meters. So if I do one by 30 meters and I do 20 beds of those, you might be able to get almost two tons actually of uh, onions in that small space. So the day you're transplanting, uh, first one week before you transplant, you need to harden the onions. What does that mean? You need to reduce the watering give them very little to no water. So they start getting, you know, they start getting stressed a little before they go out there to the very stressful life. So you harden them, you see? Like for us, you're normally hardening our children before you take them out there to the big bad world. So the same thing with the uh, onions. For one week before transplanting, harden, reduce on uh, watering completely. And then the day of transplanting, make sure where you're planting them in beds, I recommend planting beds instead of just open field. It's easier to manage your garden or your farm when you plant things in beds because you need to be able to walk, to walk through, you need to be able to spray. So when you have your plants just growing, you know, in a big field like this, you find that when people like when a peleka migum, kikanyaga, if you go inside, you're going to really mess up the garden. But if you actually put beds with very small walkways, half a foot walkways, you find managing the farm is so much better. So um, 
I normally do uh, your beds. So make sure when you're going to transplant on that particular day, make sure you're where, where you're planting the onions, the soil is well, yeah, it has enough water. Make sure you water, 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 unless it has rained the night before it's okay. But if it hasn't rained, you need to water your beds very well and make sure they are moist and wet, like matope, like mud. And then the day you're transplanting, I recommend again, cut off the tips. So if this is your onion, just cut off the tip. Cut off the tips at the top, because that actually is a method of hardening that helps them do well. I'm so excited. It's taken me two years to learn some of these lessons, my friends, such that um, when I transplant after eight weeks, because then the seedling is not too small and you know whatever and too tiny. And then when I cut, when I harden, no watering, and I cut off the tips, guys, I'm getting more than 90% survival rate of my onions and I'm really excited. So I've had to go through two years of making mistakes to share this very simple information with you, my dear friends. And then I've also found that when I plant onions on their own, they were getting a lot of thrips infestation. And thrips are one of the worst, worst pests. In fact, it's my next slide. I'm going to talk about the number one enemy of onions are thrips, at least in arid and semi-arid lands. It might be different for other ecological areas, but for now we are talking about dry areas and I'm going to focus about the experience I've had with the different insects. So when I do companion planting, where well, you've seen, like in the picture, it's very clear. I planted a row of onions and then I planted carrots and then onions and then carrots and then onions. And then you can also see my garden has a lot of trees. So we normally have a lot of trees. We plant a lot of agroforestry trees that give us shade. They fix nitrogen into the soil. You know, they actually make our plants grow so, so much better when you have trees in the area. So I find that I read this some time back. I couldn't find the paper. I wanted to share it here with you guys, but then I actually had read a paper whereby they had actually said scientifically, the best companion plant for onions is carrots. So onions normally repel carrot fly and carrots uh, for some reason, I don't know how, they, I don't have any issues with onion fly. I have very little thrip infestation when carrots are next to onions, I don't know. Maybe thrips don't like carrots, I have no idea why. And I also find that the bulb formation does quite well. To be honest, I found them to be the best friends. And this is how, if you come to my garden today, you'll find that I have um, uh, planted in this particular way. So how I do it, I have not put this in the slides, but I can quickly mention it, is that after I harvest the onions and carrots, oh yeah, something else why I like planting the onions and carrots together is because they have a similar, um, it's not called a lifespan, what is it called? Anyway, the length of time before they mature is very, very similar. So I'm able to harvest them at the same time. I'm able to take them to the market at the same time and clear the land. So how I do it, I normally, once I clear uh, my onions and um, carrots in this particular field, I normally practice crop rotation. And how do I do that? Once the onions and carrots leave, the next thing I plant are beans. So in this particular field, so I've divided my shamba into five major fields, say for example. So in one section, no, we have about uh, one, two, three, four, we have about eight sections of the farm. So each one section is always, uh, you know, has different crops, which I rotate. So once I remove the carrots and the onions, I normally would plant beans in that area. Why? Because carrots, onions are heavy feeders, carrots not so much, but onions are heavy feeders. So it means they've taken up most of the nutrition that is found in the shamba. So I want to bring back nitrogen. So I normally plant beans for 75 days. I prefer to plant mutiamania, which is a particular bean, which is a short variety bean. So I plant beans. And then when I harvest the beans, I plant indigenous vegetables for six weeks. Then after that six weeks, then I come back and plant carrot and onion. So that is my rotation. Carrot and onions, first rotation, second rotation, beans, and then third rotation, indigenous greens. When I remove that, then I go back and I find the pests are almost non-existent because the pests that would affect, say, the spider mites 
will never touch an onion. Maybe I had managu there. So I know they're not going to touch the onions, so on and so forth. So uh, being able to do companion planting and crop rotation and a proper nursery establishment will give you very good success. Next. So this is uh, the big question. Are we planting red onions? Are we planting white onions? So I've called them white because it's natural for me to call it white, but over there I've written yellow sweet bulb onions. We normally call them white, but they're actually yellow. The white onions is a very different variety. And it's an indigenous one. I know it's found in some places in Northern Kenya, but the ones you buy in the shop, they look whitish, but they're not very white, like a paper. They're actually called the yellow sweet bulb onions. So I want to give the difference between the two, and I'll tell you my preference at the end of this. So the red onions, it matures in four months, but I've also found that it, so it means it stays longer in the garden, then it's normally more susceptible to thrip infestation. So thrips love red onions, just like Kenyans, we love our red onions, so do thrips. Uh, the, the taste, of course, you know, is uh, strong and pungent, and then they do not do well in sodic soils. So I find I struggle to grow red onions in sodic soils. And for me, I have to be very careful that I've done my green manuring, I've put in my gypsum, and I've done a fertility trench for me to harvest a good harvest of red onions because the sodic soil really, because of the compaction, it, they somehow don't do very well. And then one good thing about the red onions is they're very common in the market because most people would prefer to have them. And then um, the other onion I want to talk about is the yellow sweet, sweet onion, which we call white onion. Um, they are nice, I really like them actually because they mature in three months. And then they are tolerant to sodic soils. Those ones do very well, by the way. They are not even struggling so much with the sodic soils. They're like, see, tunanda kunanda And then the taste is sweet. By the way, they actually have a sweet taste. If you actually have to use this onion in your food, it gives a very nice sweet and mild taste. And then the thrip infestation is low. Thrips, I don't know. I don't know why they don't like the this yellow sweet onion. For some reason, they don't really uh, have you know, they're not really affected by thrips. And then um, they also normally get a very good bulb size, depending on the seed you buy. And then they are mainly found in specialty markets. So you'll find them mainly um, uh, being used uh, within maybe the Asian community um, or uh, yeah, maybe Asians or like Mediterranean. But then for us Kenyans, many people don't eat it. And they don't know why, but through our shop, Sylvia's Basket, I got all my customers to start loving yellow sweet onions because I talked about them and I told them people, this is the only onion that has accepted me. Please accept it also. It's doing very well. By the way, I love planting yellow sweet onions and yeah, they're normally very nice. I recommend after this, farmers, go try plant it and also use it in your food. You'll be amazed. So let's talk about the next onion. Next slide. Yeah. There we go, spring onion. Spring onion, kikuyus, we call it kitunguya mahuti, the onion with leaves. I love them, love them, love them. Any of these ones, sorry to bring this in, but when you cook with githeri, it's like the best thing ever. So these spring onions are easy to establish. You see how they look? You just need to, you know, unbunch them, plop one in the soil. Even a three-year-old can plant a spring onion and it will survive. They have very few pests and diseases. I've just found during the hot weather, they're normally affected by the black aphids. Not always, uh, rarely, unless it's very hot, but they have very few pests. Disease, I have never seen them diseased. They need lots of water to establish, I agree, because most of my farmers, they complain during the drought. Atuna kitungu, we don't have an onion, but put them in the kitchen garden. And then the water you use for rinsing your dishes or your gray water, water it on the spring onion, you will have a spring onion all year round. So they're perennial, you know, it's a kind of never say die energizer kind of onion. You cut it, it sprouts. You try to uproot it, another one was left inside. It is just going to be there forever and ever. And I love it. And then it's ideal again, I say for kitchen gardens. So I, anyone within my earshot should always have this spring onion. Never go to the market to buy an onion. In fact, if you people were in my shamba and were in a class, I would have asked, who doesn't have an onion in their shamba? Raise up your hand. 
This is an onion that all of us should have. And by the way, I didn't want to make this presentation too long, but of all the three onions, between red, yellow sweet, and spring onion, they say, scientists say, that this green onion or spring onion is actually the most nutritious. Can you believe it? And then it's very tasty. I love it in my githeri, in my vegetables, in my meat, in everything, I love it. And it's indigenous. That's why it's so resilient. Even thrips normally don't resist. Even thrips, they can't bite, they leave it. You can still continue eating it. You just chop, eat, chop, eat, chop, eat. So I want to encourage us guys, from all the three onions, um, I've not talked about leek onion. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why it never came to mind. It's just come to me right now. I'm so sorry. Maybe it's because leek onion doesn't have a huge market. It has also specialty small markets, but I also plant it. We also have the garlic chives, which is an onion. Sorry guys, I didn't put it. But those are the four onions that I plant. So I plant red, I plant the yellow, I plant spring. Uh, oh, no, five. I plant leek and I plant garlic chives. So I have five onions that we plant in our garden. But I just put out the three major ones, which I thought would be interesting to us and are very also interesting in the market. One last thing I want to say about the spring onion. I struggled to, sorry, let me look at the time. Okay, I think I'm okay. So I struggled to sell spring onion and I have no idea why. I mean, some people normally say they are too much work to peel people, please. When you think about the nutritional value versus peeling the onion, can, can we just focus on the nutritional value and peel the onion happily and use it in our foods? I struggled to sell the spring onions for almost two years at the shop. You know, every week I'd be there, hi guys, Here's my spring onion. Hi guys, please buy spring onion. Please use spring onion. And I'm so excited to report that when I bring spring onions to the shop, they normally sell out every single week. We've not had them for some time because it's been so dry. But hopefully in the next month, we'll be having lots of spring onions. So I would like to encourage you guys. I know some of you will say, if I do it commercially, I won't sell. But let me give you an assignment. Walk to any market. The time I went to a market nearby home, in, uh, it's called Wangige Market, and they were selling spring onions, so expensive, I could not believe it. So this indigenous food of ours has become a specialty item. Can you imagine that? That as we're running for red onions, people want spring. Why do they want it? Because they know spring onions have been grown, they're easy to establish, they've been grown naturally. So the incidence of chemicals and pests in the spring onion is very, 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 very minimal. That's why people really enjoy using the spring onion because they're normally very healthy and chances of it being sprayed with pesticides and all is extremely minimal. So those who are health conscious are eating more spring onions because they know they don't have any chemicals. Okay, let's continue. So here I've talked about the number one enemy of uh, onion farmers, thrips. The pictures are not so clear, but I tried to get them as clear as possible. If you look, bottom right, you're going to see um, uh, the effect of uh, the, what do you call it? The thrips on the onions. If you look at the bottom right, you will see it right there. Ratim was trying to zoom out for us, perfect. You'll see that, um, you know, what it looks like. That's the damage. If you're wondering what is happening, that is the damage that you'll find on your onion. That is the trip. You see them doo-doo up there? It has done that. And it basically, you know, it sucks out the chlorophyll. And what happens is your onion ends up so small. Like if it's a bulb onion, it will be small, very small, and not ideal for the market. So um, trips are terrible. And to be honest, I don't know what the solution would be. Because I have worked with different stakeholders, and I'm yet to find a single pesticide that is going to work organic. I'm talking about organic pesticide that works with trips effectively. And this is, I know there are some scientists who are listening to me. These are call to action. Let's do more research on how to support farmers to control trips in onions. So they're resistant to all, almost all synthetic inputs. In fact, my farmers in my Mahi normally tell me that, you know, Sylvia or Mama McKenna, I actually stopped planting onions because of thrips. 
they say in Kiswahili, hizo vitu hazisiki dawa, like, okay, if it's direct translation, it's like they don't hear medicine. <laughs> but it's not about hearing, but it's like they are actually resistant to this synthetic pesticides. So if you find thrips in your garden, please do not bother your money or your pocket or your wallet to go buy the synthetic inputs. It will not work. And then the only way to manage thrips is prevention. And I learned this the hard way. You have to ensure your soils are healthy and your plants are not stressed. With any other disease that we normally would talk about out here, you'll find viruses and disease will normally attack the persons whose immunity is compromised or is low. The same thing with plants. If your plant is not well watered, if your plant is not healthy, if your soils are not healthy, it means the immunity, quote unquote, of your plant is normally compromised. So if it's compromised, and it's going to be more susceptible to infestation by pests and by diseases. So you have to make sure your soils are healthy. I've already gone through it, I think, quite well on how to have healthy soils. You have to make sure your plants are not stressed, which means they're getting enough water, they have enough nutrition, you put enough compost, you put enough manure. So they're just happily growing, just very happily growing. And that is one way of preventing pests. But if you must use anything, I would recommend you use neem oil again, because um, I don't know if it kills on contact, scientists can confirm it, because I'm also here to learn. Um, but neem oil could kill on contact, I'm not sure, but it's also an uh, anti-appetite when it goes to bite. It's like, uh -uh, you know, neem oil is more robaini. Uh, in Kiswahili, for those who may not be aware, it's neem. Have you ever taken tea or like taken marubaini? You know, it is so bitter. It is so bitter. It's very difficult to ingest. And as children, when we used to visit my auntie in Mombasa, hey, she used to make us drink neem. I used to be like, oh my gosh, she's like, this is so healthy for you. But let me tell you, it's so bitter. Even the thieves don't like it. You can also use what I've called deep sky blue. Deep sky blue. It's a particular color that attracts the males, uh, the thieves, sorry. So you put, you put the sticky traps and it's going to mainly attract the trips. I also noticed um, this was just interesting that it happened. It actually also attracted onion fly. So I managed to uh, manage the trips and onion flies with the sticky traps, which was very interesting. And you need to put the neem oil, you spray neem oil in the nursery and also soon after transplanting. If you use that as a prevention method, you should be okay without any problems with trips. And then the final and most important thing, you have to weed your onion field every three weeks. And let me tell you a mistake I made. I used to weed um, the field where the onions were, but I was not keen to weed around the garden, to weed around the field. And I used to wonder where are these trips coming from? Where are they coming from? Do you know, as I said earlier, the weeds are the houses of pests. Kindly, if you forget everything else, remember, weeds are houses for pests. When I started, when I weed my onion field, I actually weed in between the onions and I weed all around, all around. And one way of uh, like preventing the, like around your field having a lot of weeds, plant fodder, plant napier. Because as you're watering your onions, the napier is also getting water and you have enough fodder for your animals. And the napier is normally quite aggressive. You will not have weeds competing with it. Or plant grasses, you know, something that is not going to, don't leave the place bare because you're going to keep weeding. No, weed, plant grass, plant napier, plant flowers. I've given you another idea, plant your flowers there. It helps a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So make sure you weed your onion field every three weeks. For us, we make sure after transplanting, three weeks later, we weed. After another three weeks, we weed. We normally weed about maybe three to four times. I know it's quite a bit, but if you keep your field free of weeds, you'll be free of trips. But other ways to tell you that there's one particular silver bullet that will manage trips is a lie. But that's how we manage the major pests in onions. Okay, I'll continue. Oh, okay, we're coming to the end. So I found this very, very nice picture and I'm happy to share it with anyone who'd be interested on how to uh, dry and cure your onions, you know. 
I found it very nice. Okay, this is mainly for um, Asia. I found it from a site in Asia. That's why they're talking about palm leaves and bamboo or timber, you know, we don't have much bamboo here, but please plant bamboo guys. We've planted dryland bamboo and it's amazing. It's doing a lot of work for us. So uh, this one even has a measurement and this is basically just for a small homestead uh, whereby you can actually be able to dry your onions. And one thing I like about is the covering. So you avoid them being exposed to direct sunlight. Some people still do direct sunlight, but sometimes I find direct sunlight uh, will make your onions be more damaged and also takes out, um, you know, the water, too much of the water from the onions. So yeah, we can look at that um, picture, but basically you need to be able to uh, like harvest your onions when most of the tops have fallen or begun to dry. So you'll basically just see the top of the onion, you know, like falling down. That's when you know, and they look like they are drying up, you know, that is the end life cycle of the onion. And then after you harvest, you know, you have to dry or cure the onions in a warm, dry and well ventilated locations, such as the shed that I have uh, shown here. Because I kept wondering, you know, what can work for us? I'm a bit lucky because I'm doing it at a large scale. So I have a dehumidifier that helps uh, them to dry in one week and they're normally pretty good to go. But for farmers, you know, who are starting out and doing uh, like in a you know, small area, I recommend you can try out the shed that uh, I have here in the presentation. You don't have to do the exact same thing, but you can be able to replicate that shed uh, for your needs. Then of course, you know, just spread out the like onions in a single layer on a clean dry surface, as you can see there. And you can be able to cure the onions for two to three weeks until the tops and necks are thoroughly dry and the outer bulb scales begin to rustle. You know, when you hold the onion and you can hear that, you know that, yeah, they are now nice and dry. And the top, you know, the top part is actually quite dry. They are very dry. Most of them even just fall out by themselves. That's when you know that they are drying. And then you have to place the cured onions in a mesh bag or an old nylon stocking, a wire basket or a crate for storage. And they can be able to store for quite some time, even two months without any problems, as long as they were dried well. One thing I want to bring out here, which is very unfortunate for us Kenyans. Do you know, Kenyans are now using herbicides or some sort of chemical to dry onions. And they do it in the field. It is the most unfortunate thing ever. So they're actually spraying chemicals in the field to dry the onions, and then they bring them to the market for consumption. It is a very, very, very dirty thing to do. I could not even believe it. And I've actually, let me tell you, it is true. Because there was a time I had a lot of yellow sweet onions and I didn't have a market for them. Because again, as Kenyans have not adopted it so much. I had tons of it and I was wondering where do I take this? So I called a local market here in Kenya. I'll actually tell you, it was around Ngara market. And you know, the guy asked me um, in Kiswahili, whether I, I, whether I dried using the chemicals because that has most people now, he was saying almost everyone he knows is drying with chemicals. I told him, no, we are drying them the natural way. We, are, we have a shed you know, where we're actually putting them in and we dry them. And you know, he was in total utter shock that we are drying them in that way. He was saying, when you don't know about this chemical we are using, and this is a big, big, big wholesale person selling onions. Guys, be careful about the onions you're eating out there. It's so unfortunate, but majority of the onions in Kenya are not dried in the right way. And at some point, I know some Kenyans even stopped eating onions here. They wanted, when you go to the market, you said, we want the ones from Tanzania. Because the ones in Tanzania, they're still drying with the sun. They're drying in natural ways. Hey, people, please, let's do the, because you know, there's no use having grown your onions organically, and then you add chemicals at the very end. It's such a bad thing, and I, I feel so sad, but yeah, that's, the world we are living in. And that's why you find many people prefer the spring onions. Now, those who are clever, they're like, I'd rather eat a spring onion, but a bulb onion, Madawa, it has too many chemicals. So unfortunately, we want shortcuts to be able to, you know, to dry our onions, but please, please, I just highly, highly discourage that kind of uh, practice. 
Okay. Next, Ratemo. Finally, feed yourself first. Feed yourself first. So that's a picture of uh, a marketing post that we normally do on our Instagram page of our green leafy vegetables. I thought that would be a good parting shot. But make it a point to have a kitchen garden and to provide for your family's nutritional needs all year round. Guys, we know container farming. You know, you don't have to say I don't have a compound. You have containers. There's plastic all over the place. At least plant a spring onion. By the end of this presentation, please plant a spring onion. But be able to think about how you can be able to meet your family's nutritional needs all year round. Make sure your family is able to receive, as we saw earlier, that the um, green leafy vegetables are very, very nutritious, especially the African indigenous ones are extremely, extremely nutritious. So let's make sure we can meet our family's nutritional needs all year round. Start small so as to learn how to grow your greens and onions using sustainable farming practices. I know many people call me Sylvia. Now after this, we'll be like, I have 50 acres lying around in Kitale. I would like to grow onions. No, 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 please kindly. No, 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 no. First plant onions on half an acre. Learn how to manage the pests. Learn how to do the weeding. Cause you know, you also have to extrapolate the cost. Weeding is very expensive. So plant your onions on half an acre. See, okay. How much seed did I use? How much labor for weeding? Um, you know, uh, compost. Did you, like, was it enough? How did they manage the pests? So start small. Start small. Feed your family, your church, your community, and then you can be able to move into commercial practices. And then only go commercial when you have identified a market and you're able to supply consistently. The only thing I want to give as a disclaimer about consistently is seasonal. Onions are also seasonal. Um, sorry for not putting this in. As I'm doing the presentation, I'm remembering and just learning. I remember we're here to learn together. Onions normally do well between the months of, um, from the short rains. If you plant your onions, make sure you're transplanting them in September. So what you do, if you have a big piece of land, plant them every month from September. Make sure you have a field where you plant in September, plant in October, plant in November, plant in December, in January, February, and March. After that, it's a bit tricky. I'm planting a little, not too many now, because uh, what happens is by the time it gets to July, say you planted in March, so March, April, May, June. No, March is okay, April, April, May, June. Yeah, the ones you plant in April and June may not do very well because the onions bulb after about being in the field for about two months. And at that time, they need the temperatures in the soil to be a bit high. So if your temperatures are low, below 20, yeah, I think below 20 degrees centigrade, they will not form a bulb. And if they don't form a bulb really, you're going to harvest a spring onion and you planted a bulb onion, which is very discouraging. So um, if you want to go commercial, I recommend work on your nursery very well, plant them monthly all the way from September to March. So you're going to have uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, yeah, seven months a year in an asal area. But if your place is really, really dry and warm, then you can plant onions all year round and enjoy the market like everybody else. Thank you so much. I think that comes to the end of my presentation. Please, people, keep in touch. Uh, I've put up my handles for Facebook, Sylvia's Basket, Instagram, Sylvia's Basket. You have our website. And personally, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Kuria underscore Sylvia. I pass on the um, mic back to Atemo. Thank you, Sylvia. I think we want to applaud you for the great presentation. Now, for our Facebook followers, they have questions for you. Um, do I read one by one as you answer? Um, yeah, though I have my notebook here, I don't know what works. Do you want to read maybe three or four questions? And then I'll and, be able to answer them together, yeah. Yeah, for our followers, continue posting. We have now the Q&A session for around 20 minutes. So Sylvia is here to answer all your concerns regarding onion and leafy vegetables. 
So from Samson in small uh, comments. So Samson from Slowfoot, Kenya in the house. Many youth shy away from indigenous vegetables because they are bitter. I would like to tell them that bitter is always better. Yeah, that's more of a comment. Thank you, thank you, Sam. <laughs> then we have two questions from Michael Moraidi from Thailand, Kenya. So how can I test the soil organically? And then he has also asked, what are the nitrogen fixing plants? I think we are focused on acyl areas. So what okay. are the nitrogen fixing plants? Because you mentioned things only. Then there are also another question from Peter, Peter Mwangi. In terms of the gypsum, will the gypsum affect soil pH? Have you got that question? Yeah. Okay, let me, let me, so will the gypsum affect soil pH? If no, how did you manage to lower it from a month age to optimally achieve what the onion requires? So that's from Peter Mwangi. So you can start with those ones as people continue to share. Okay. Mm. Asante sana Ratemo, and thank you so much, uh, Sam. I you said bitter is better. And something else, Sam, um, uh, from Slow Food, if I'm not wrong, I think you're going to be having Slow Food. Let me advertise for them uh, openly. I hope it hasn't passed. If it has passed, Sam, please forgive me. But I think Slow Food Kenya is going to be having uh, a world soup day whereby they actually uh, cook nice food, uh, indigenous food, food that would have been thrown in, you know, uh, like to be thrown away or dumped, but they actually, bring this food back to life. And um, they also have uh, sessions whereby they actually teach people how to cook indigenous foods. Uh, you know, that's normally out there. And even us with our farmers, you know, nobody should ever tell me Nderema ama Morenda is too slimy. No, 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 no. Those foods are good. And we teach you people how to cook them with something we call monyu mushereka. I know you know that one. Anyway, so about testing soil organically, to be honest, I know there could be ways, and I would ask Grace, uh, who is our soil expert, to please answer that part. Grace, are you here? I normally would just take it to a lab, to be honest. But I don't know if there are ways in which you can be able to test it organically. Ratemo, is Grace here to help me with that answer? Or Sam, is Sam around? Grace is online. Is Grace able to? Grace, confirm you can, uh, you can hear us. Maybe I you can like this. attempt the other questions I think as, I, as I call her. Not to worry. But the other thing I wanted to say is, I think there's a way we used to use this, you know, this litmus test. I don't know even how well I did in chemistry, but the way you can be able to put the different, uh, there's a litmus test you, you can do to test uh, the pH, whether it's high or low. I think there's a basic, test you can be able to do by yourself at home, check whether it's high or low. Uh, uh, like Ratemo through Grace and our other master trainer, his name is Samuel Derito from uh, GBAC, would be able to answer that question very well. I don't want to pretend to know how to do that, but I can be able to answer about the nitrogen fixing plants. That one, I'm happy to answer that one. So basically um, you can plant any leguminous crop. And what I've done, to make sure that my soil always has enough nitrogen. Apart from doing the green manuring, whereby you plant uh, your, your legumes and incorporate them back into the soil, I also have rows of, of nitrogen fixing trees in the garden. So what we've done, we've divided our farm into uh, blocks of 10 meters. So between the 10 meters, we have uh nitrogen fixing trees so if this is the beginning of the bed so on this row we have nitrogen fixing trees then 10 meters nitrogen fixing trees 10 meters nitrogen fixing trees that's one way of making sure you always have because how does it work the leaves have nitrogen when they fall down and also the roots actually fix nitrogen into the soil what kind of trees am i talking about you can plant um um hmm. Acacia, very good. You can plant sesbania, sespan, 
you can plant Caliandra, uh, you can plant Lucena. And the good thing about Caliandra, Lucena, and Sesbania Sesban is they are fast growing. In one year, your tree is almost established. Two years, fully established, fixing nitrogen and doing wonders in your garden. So apart from the legumes, you can also plant trees, rows of trees in your garden. And then about the gypsum affecting the soil pH, to be honest, um, I, you know, it's so embarrassing to say, but I need to be honest that I took so long to test my soil, which was uh, a year ago, before I was just planting things and wondering why they're not doing very well. So I am due to actually go and test my pH now to see whether it's actually come down. The optimum is should be about seven and mine was 8.3. Because above eight, 8.5, your soils are sodic. So I'm going to test it in two weeks time. Uh, you can send me a personal message and I can share with you what the results show. But results from my eyes <laughs> and a number of seasons later, the onions are doing marvelously. In fact, they're doing so well. I cannot believe it that just applying, in fact, the first time I applied gypsum, there was a huge change in the soil and the way the germination and how the onions were doing. So um, four seasons later, um, I can't complain. To be honest, my onions are just better. So even just from my observation, they're doing very well. I'll go back and test again. I was actually just, um, you know, when I was doing my presentation, I did a lot of reading and watching videos. One particular video said gypsum can actually be effective for four years. I was like, oh, okay, that's good to know. So I didn't know it can be that effective. So if it's applied well, it can be effective for about four years. But then um, I'm already seeing very good results from uh, the, the harvest. I see Grace is here and she has said she wants to respond to our question on testing soil organically. Grace, over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, the questions are very interesting and I've realized there's a lot of interest in um, onions. So back to the question, I would answer by saying there is no specific way that we could say this is the organic way of testing soil, but we do the normal testing. So it's important for every farmer to test their soils in the laboratories available. And it is uh, one thing that we've also observed, most farmers just test the pH, but it is also important to test the other nutrients, the levels of the other nutrients. Like if we are adding potassium, are we sure that that is what our soils need? So we need to be in a position to tell the levels of potassium, of magnesium, of the my, micro and macro elements in the soils are very clear so that we are advised on what to use. So um, my answer is yes, test to the soils. And uh, because I've realized that uh, farmers also have their own experiences, you can also be able to tell that there is something missing in my soil by observing the crops. Especially when you've been farming for quite some time, you will realize, for example, if your crops are um, germinating so well, by the time they are knee high, you realize the color is changing. That should tell you that you need a, a top dresser. But at the same time, that is what you are observing. But the key is to test the soil. So I'll answer by saying it is important to test the soils. And um, observation can also help to realize that. But the perfect way is by testing. Thank you. And back to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Grace. Ratemo, are there any more questions or comments? There are some comments from Vincent Odongo. So he says there, there, there is a gadget which is bought in the market, which you only insert in the soil, and it will give you the pH readings. Then you find an average of the entire field based on sampling procedure and guidelines. And then to also add on your gypsum uh, discussion, you are saying gypsum contains microorganisms which make the soil nutrients and make it available for the plants. That is why it affects the plant nutrients. Just adding to your discussion. Eh? Thank but you. So far, there are no more questions. I assume they have learned a lot. For me, I've learned a lot. 
I used to have a small uh, kitchen garden on my balcony for mm -hmm. spring onions. I think I'm going to bring it back. <laughs> you better revive it. <laughs> my neighbor used to pick my onions. So most times it was like I was growing for her. But I know. <laughs> I'm going to do that again. And I think we want to now finish because there are no more questions from our viewers. Unless there's someone who has a burning question, please post. Then a comment from C Shep. She, she has said, she has said, we remember that we have one of our master trainer, Dr. Mihindo, who offers soil testing. So yes. in case you have soil that you want to test, I'm going to tag him on the chat. You reach out to him. He has fair rates, depending on the level of tests you want. There's complete, there's basic, and there's pathogenic, if I'm not wrong. Right, Sylvia? Yeah. Yes, very so, true. Um, yeah, we have resources within us, but you have to look for some few coins so that you pay for the lab. The lab needs money to operate. So he has a lab that he operates in Riru. I'm going to tag him. If you have any soil you want test, you will just reach out direct. Sure. Thank you, Esther, for that. And thank you for representing c -Shep. Now, I think we have closed. Maybe we can just share parking shots and then we close the webinar. We are going to start with our multiplier who is online, Terry. Are you able to, to talk? Yes, I'm able. Are you getting me? Yes, yes. yes. Share something like a parting shot for our listeners. Yes, me, I'm really very grateful. Like I've got to learn a lot about the spring onions and even the vegetables and pests and diseases. Thanks a lot to our facilitator, Sylvia and Grace and even Pelham Kenya for giving us this chance to learn a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Grace, we want to finish. You have a parting shot for our listeners. Yes. Um, first of all, I want to appreciate Sylvia for bracing the way the pioneer of uh, such trainings. And uh, it has been a very impactful session. And as you rightfully said, Ratemo, it gets you back to your kitchen and uh, kitchen garden. And you're like, now I know what has been ailing me. So thank you, Silva, Sylvia, and especially for your personal experiences that you share. I think most of the farmers would really appreciate what you're sharing from your own personal experience at your farm level. And uh, that is very key. Thank you very much. Thank you for our multipliers who are following online and every other person who has joined us. We are looking forward to more series to come. Thank you, Ratemo, Thank you. for the great facilitation. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia, do you want to say something? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think this was wonderful. And I'm so grateful to Pelham Kenya, Bivat, KCOA, being able to give us such a wonderful platform uh, to actually share our experiences, what we are learning on the farms and being able to information. You know, one of the things we keep saying is chance to actually share. It's been so good and I've really enjoyed it myself. And thank you so much for the questions, the comments, the interactions. And I hope that uh, by the end of this all, we are not going to go back and think about arid and semi-arid lands as places where people are just talking about with sheep and goods. No, arid and semi-arid lands <laughs> can also be used for planting vegetables, that, which are high value, which are highly nutritious, and are able to give farmers a very good income. Asante sana. Thank you, Sylvia. So we want to conclude uh, the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining. And we also want to appreciate the KCOA project for sponsoring this webinar. We're going to have them every month on different topics. So continue following our Pelham pages. We have Pelham Kenya on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. 
please continue to follow us. We are going to share more webinars throughout the year. So asante ni sana, and we now want to stop there. We are going to share all the resources, the presentation. Uh, I'm going to share the link on the chat and everyone can be able to download and have a look at the amazing presentation done by Sylvia. So let's all put our camera and then we say bye to our, our listeners from all over the country. Tevi. Yes. <laughs> 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 bye I don't bye. have a camera, Sheba. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for joining. Bye. <laughs>